Hello, Petal. How are you doing? How's your weekend? Do you work weekends or do you have a weekend? Let me know in the comments. Has spring started where you are? Or are you just about to have summer? What season are you in right now? Be interesting to know. I absolutely love the conversations that are going on in the comments right now. Really brings a smile to my face and I hope it brings a smile to your faces too. So, the usual thing, if you could leave a like and hit the notifications bell. And if you want to share it, awesome. If you don't, that's okay too. If you want to subscribe, fantastic. But if you don't, that's fine too. <laughs> but we are at chapter 12 of the Better Mousetrap, J.W. Wells & Co. Book 5 by the amazing, the stupendous, the fantastic Tom Holt. These are all pre-recorded. And when the premiere goes up, it sends you a little notification to say it's the first um, the first play. And that's when the little chat's going to be there for everybody to join in. The wonderful thing is we've got people from all over the world, which is lovely, from like each hemisphere and all over the place. And of course, clock's going forward in some places, clock's going back in other places. I can't keep up. Anyway, I'm going to stop waffling and we're going to crack on with this chapter. <laughs> chapter 12. Woo! <laughs> The dragon stirred. Curious animals, dragons. Awake, they have the intelligence of a small rock, being much closer in evolutionary terms to their dinosaur ancestors than most of their contemporaries in the animal kingdom. They retain the subsidiary brain at the base of the spine, to which the majority of motor functions and other mundane day-to-day -day concerns are delegated. The tennis ball-sized lump of grey splodge in their heads barely ticks over during the day. It operates the eyelids, handles sneezing and a few other respiratory odds and ends, and keeps a subconscious track of the stock market and commodity prices using the inbuilt organic modem located down and a little to the right of the bladder. Otherwise, it just sits there, not doing much, until consciousness puts the chairs up on the tables and closes up for the night. And then... The dreams come, flooding the upper brain with thoughts so huge they'd blow out the walls of a human mind. Thousand-year thoughts, intricate as clockwork and lace, deep as oceans, teeming with precepts and hypotheses, paradigms, abstracts and equations, concepts so utterly alien to a two-ton, forty-foot lizard that it could never begin to understand them in its conscious state. Dragon's dream in at least seventeen dimensions – Drifting like wind-blown leaves from past to future, soaring like birds over the dividing lines that separate alternate realities, sampling base eight gravities in continua, where sound moves faster than light, and the universe isn't so much curved as dimpled. Flirting with the possibilities of movement in the z-squared axis, redefining every constant a million times each second, this goes some way towards explaining why. Dragons love cool, dark places where they can sleep undisturbed, snuggled up on golden batteries from which their forebrains draw the vast quantities of raw power needed to fuel their imaginations. Because, without the gold, silver, jewels and other isotopes of wealth, the dream simply won't come. Nobody knows why this should be, although accountants seem able to understand it on a purely intuitive level. Amelia Carrington's dragon was, of course, slightly different from the rest of its kind. Hardly surprising, since it had been conceived and born in a vat of green slime in a lock-up garage in Ravenscourt Park. Its dreams were wild, fast and dark, and saturated with disturbing images of its own imminent death. Not that it minded that particularly. When the future is as real and immediate as the present or the past, the end is no more intimidating than any other arbitrary point on the circumference of the circle. What prompted it to stir, shiver and grunt was nothing at all to do with fear, a sensation as irrelevant to dragon kind as income tax. It was something small. A tiny inconsistency, an equation that failed to balance at the 20,000th decimal place. A human brain simply couldn't have registered it. The dragon woke up. Snarl, it thought. Hungry, cramping, big, flappy, flying with thing. 
It stretched its neck and snapped up a mutton carcass from the overhead rack, so thoughtfully provided by the management, spread and refolded its wings, yawned to the melting point of glass, and went back to sleep. A human. The dragon placed her on the table of its mental centrifuge and spun her until the future separated from the past. The residue was quite interesting. Strong influences, restraining rather than inspiring, so that it saw them as clamps and buckles. The precipitate was a confusing jumble of shapes and colours, red for blood, silver for tears, black for anger and a faintly nauseating pink for the purely human emotion, whose name temporarily escaped it. Lots of pink. It tinged the edges of everything, like the marinade in Chinese pork. The dragon wondered how so much emotion could be fitted into such a small container without breaking something. It own death. Smaller than it would have expected, rounder and smoother. There would be a moment in a dream when the circle was welded shut. No bad thing, since the dream would go on forever, uninterrupted by the distractions of consciousness. The human's death, by contrast, was a messy thing like the frayed end of a broken robe. In fact, there was an unusual quality about it, so different from the sad peterings out of ordinary humans. It wasn't a whole number. It was a fraction. It was recurring. None of our business, the dragon thought, because we won't be there to see it. By then, the circle will have closed, excluding all irrelevant data, but still. The prophecy... The greatest dragon ever born, only the strongest, bravest hero that ever lived will prevail against it. Of course, all prophecies are garbage, apart from the true ones. The dragon grunted and shuffled about. Under its vast, smooth belly, Krugerans clinked and share certificates crinkled. Six dozen infrared movement sensors woke up, accessed their programming, grumbled and went back to sleep. And the dream swept on, riding the lightning into far galaxies of intervals, sequences and primes until the human was too small even for a sleeping dragon to see. Humans? So what? Their salvation was their ignorance of their own supreme triviality, without which the sheer bulk of proportion would flatten them into faint smears. In spite of that, however, a flavour of her steered with it as it danced on a 5,000 light-year diameter pinhead. It would know her again when they met, and for the first time the dragon would feel, permeating right through into its inert forebrain, compassion. When is a door not a door? When it's a wall. The wall opened, and Colin Gomez, of all people, walked in through it, Emily looked up from the corner where she'd been sitting and stared at him for a moment, too stunned to be relieved or angry. Anybody else but not him. What the hell, she demanded, is going on? He looked at her, and in his eyes she recognised the comforting thought that he wasn't going to have to try and explain himself, make excuses, apologise politely to somebody who'd be dead in a minute or so. She sprang to her feet, but she wasn't quick enough. He took a paper bag out of his pocket, emptied it on the floor and dived back through the wall, which healed up as though he'd never been breached. Paper bag, she thought. White things, all over the floor, crossed between broad beans and bits of dried up chewing gum. She knew what they were. Not good at all. The reason why dragon's teeth fetch such a high price on the open market is that, sown like seed corn on any flat, non-ferrous surface, they sprout into savagely psychotic spectral warriors. <laughs> there are drawbacks. The warriors come fully armed, but their equipment is hopelessly antiquated. Sword, shield, breastplate, helmet, a spear or two if you're lucky, but don't count on it. And although they fight with unbelievable ferocity until they run out of enemies or are themselves cut down, they are not bulletproof. Clearly this limits their relevance to modern warfare, and they're chiefly used as assassins, riot police, and for crowd control at music festivals. To Emily, armed with nothing but a thermos flask and a plate of cheese sandwiches, they nevertheless posed a very serious problem. Colin, she called out. 
Mr. Gomez, get back here right now. No answer. Not that she'd really been expecting one, and besides, could sound pass through that wall. She doubted it. The teeth, meanwhile, were sprouting, little white arms and legs, little bumps like the nobbles on potatoes for heads, spiders, she thought, and she lifted her foot and stamped on the nearest one. The pain was excruciating, even through the sole of her shoe, and the little white thing carried on growing. Oh, she thought, a plate of sandwiches and a thermos. She could break the plate, that'd give her a sharp edge, and the thermos would just about do as a club for one hit. It was what Kurt Lundvist or Ricky Wormtoter or Archie St. Clair Lutterworth would have done. Bruno Schlager had taken out a whole platoon of dark elves with a plastic fork and hadn't the great Nepalese maestro Ram Lal Bahadur once disemboweled twenty Imperial Guards with a comb and a toothbrush. The first couple of warriors were knee-high now, crash test dummies with round featureless white heads and faint lines to mark where their armour would be. Two things that Lundqvist, Wormtorter, Lutterworth, Schlage and Bader all had in common. One, they were all men. Two, eventually they were all killed. Emily stepped back until the wall got in the way. They were at the badly moulded reproduction terracotta warrior stage now, just starting to acquire faces, their hair still just a faint pattern of impressed lines. Probably the spectral warrior equivalent of teenagers, she thought. Yeah. Now, she thought, would be a really good time for Frank to come through the wall. <laughs> so perfect, in fact, would the timing have been that she actually looked round, expecting to see the thin black lines spreading on the whitewashed surface like ink soaking into blotting paper. But they didn't, and while she was looking the other way, the first warrior must have finished growing, because when she looked back, there he was, <laughs> six feet eight of lean muscles, shining armour and gormless expression. He had a short sword in one hand and a round shield about the size of a lollipop lady sign in the other. He hadn't moved yet. Right, here goes, Emily smiled. Hello, boys, she said brightly. Who wants a nice cup of tea and a sandwich? Of course, it shouldn't have worked. If she'd tried it in the practical in her college mid-year exams, they'd have failed her on the spot. Spectral warriors, they'd have told her as they helped her pack are programmed to be ruthless, unthinking killers. Try that in the field, they'd have told her, and they'll be sending you home in a small plastic bag. There were twelve of them, all motionless, looking straight at her. She took a deep breath. But the other thing about spectral warriors is that, in spite of their unnatural genesis and peremptory growth, they're still basically just soldiers. And what does a soldier do? Arriving at a new and unfamiliar posting to find a nice girl handing out tea and sawneys? Cut her head off and jump up and down on a mangled trunk? Don't be silly. The spectral Lance Corporal nodded and slowly extended his new, unused arm. Straight away, Emily wedged the flask top into his hand and poured him some tea. Bit of a cock up with the catering, she said cheerfully. So you'll all have to share. Also, there's no sugar, but I do have some sweeteners. From her bag, she produced a little green plastic tube. She held it over the cup and pressed the lid, discharging little white pellets. Pass the cup along, she said, and dig into the sandwiches. The Lance Corporal took a swig of tea and handed the cup on, then reached for a sandwich. For thirty seconds, or thereabouts, Emily was kept busy refilling the cup and passing the plate round, then, orderly as a line of dominoes, the spectral warrior slowly keeled over and crashed to the floor. Lucky, she thought, as she stepped over the Lance Corporal, that she'd forgotten to return the tranquilizers to store after she dealt with the dragon in the National Lombard in Finchurch Street. Lucky, too, that they'd been the extra-strong, concentrated variety. One tablet guaranteed to knock a fully grown manticore out cold for six hours, all your money back and your funeral expenses paid. It was, of course, only a temporary expedient. Sooner or later, they were going to wake up again, and chances were they'd have headaches and be extremely cross with her. Only one thing to do, therefore. She tugged a warrior's sword out of its scabbard and pressed it against its throat. Spiders, she thought. The sword point wasn't very sharp, designed for strength, presumably. A needle-sharp point would just snap off if you snapped it against armour. A certain degree of force seemed to be called for. Right, Emily thought. But there's no tearing hurry. 
As soon as they start showing signs of waking up, I'll kill the lot of them. <laughs> Just not yet. She looked around at the table, where she'd put down the empty plate. It was loaded with fresh sandwiches. She wasn't surprised. The thermos was probably full again, too. If you're planning on keeping a prisoner long-term in a sealed, doorless room, something of the sort is pretty much essential. So, she thought, even if I do slaughter the lot of them, I still won't be getting out of here in a hurry, and Colin Gomez has got the rest of the teeth I pulled out of that dragon, and even if the same trick works a second time, there's only about four tranquilizers left. Hmm. Still screwed. Just checking. In which case, why bother scragging the warriors after all? If they came to and killed her, they'd be doing her a favour. Otherwise, all she had to look forward to was staring at the walls and eating sandwiches until such a time as Colin Gomez figured out a way of killing her that she couldn't count her. Wouldn't take him long. But why hang about? Only delaying the inevitable. And besides, she'd died before, and it didn't seem to have done her any harm. Yes. But that was because Frank Carpenter had been around with his portable door, and that was only because Mr Sprague was paying him to save the insurance company the cost of a heavy claim. But Mr Sprague wasn't there any more. Would Frank be along to undo her death if he wasn't getting paid for it? Well, probably he would, if he found out that she'd died. But she couldn't rely on that. Psychology of young men in love. He calls leaves messages, nor reply, so he assumes he's been issued with the regulation cold shoulder and slouches away to wallow in misery for a bit, until some other girl comes along. Somehow, the human race has contrived to find this sort of thing unbearably romantic for thousands of years. As far as Emily was concerned, it wasn't even slightly romantic, just damned inconvenient. Let the spectral warriors kill her then? No. Absolutely not. Quite apart from being dead aspect of it, she was buggered if she was going to let the spiders win. Over her dead body, in fact. In that case, Emily was either going to have to kill the spectral warriors in their sleep or find a way out of there. She considered the options. The mass slaughter option had one thing going for it, a quality which the alternative so demonstrably lacked. It could be done. After all, she told herself, it's not as if they're people... Their teeth, and if a tooth starts hurting, you trot along to the dentist and have it drilled or pulled. A simple, guilt-free occurrence, and you don't tend to get ghosts of all your past teeth standing over your bed, rattling their fillings at you in your sleep and giving you nightmares. Correction. They were teeth. Not any more, though. Emily swore, threw the sword across the room and sat down on the floor. All right, she asked herself. What would Captain Picard do in my shoes? Well, obviously he'd engage the warriors in meaningful dialogue, convince them that it was all in their best interest to work together to find an effective, but non-violent, way of getting out of there, probably involving reconfiguring the biostatic matrix on some handy electronic gadget he just happened to have with him. Not like that in real life, of course. True. The tube of tranquilizers had been a lucky break. But tranks were the sort of thing she tended to carry about, being an essential commodity in her line of work. So it wasn't the same at all. Not cheating. And apart from them, everything else she had about her person was just so much useless junk. Look at it for crying out loud. She started turning out her pockets onto the bare stone floor. Lipstick, compact... Three ballpoint pens, two non-functional, but if we could somehow reverse the polarities, we could rig up some kind of interplexing beacon. Kleenex, the silver paper from a roll of polo mints, a comb, a small cardboard tube. Emily binked. A small cardboard tube. The sort of thing you find behind the lavatory door when an inconsiderate person's been using it before you. Apart from the Blue Peter crew and maybe the Andrex puppy, no one on earth could have a use for one. Except that she'd seen one, just like it. Absolutely just like it, in the hands of Frank Carpenter. Come off it, she said to herself. One bog roll tube looks pretty much like another, and just because one specimen contains the portable door, that doesn't mean they all do. It's just a cardboard tube I must have picked up somewhere, though why on earth I'd want to do that? She remembered. 
The dragon, the same one whose teeth were cluttering up the floor she was sitting on. The dragon who turned a billion dollars into ash, but who died guarding this plain brown cardboard cylinder. Now what would a creature devoted to acquiring and hoarding items of great value want with the core out of a toilet roll? Hardly able to breathe, Emily poked about inside it with her fingertip. Oh, there was something in there, all right. Something rubbery, thin, rolled up. It could, of course, turn out to be the board from a travelling Ludo set. Only one way to find out. But it couldn't be the door, because Frank had it. He'd used it to get in and out of Sprague's office, and when she'd come through into this room, it had stayed behind with him. She was absolutely sure about that. Besides... What was she thinking? If this was the dragon's tube, it had been there in her pocket ever since she'd killed the bloody thing, so Frank couldn't have been using it ever since. The whole point was, there was only one portable door in existence. Only... She poked a little further and a corner slid out. Gripping it between forefinger and thumb, she pulled gently. The roll of thin, plasticky sheet fell into her lap. She picked it up, and it unrolled like unruly wallpaper. The portable door. That was the moment when one of the spectral warriors grunted and stretched in his sleep, inadvertently kicking Emily's ankle. She jumped, nearly dropped the door, juggled with it, caught it, and hugged it to her. Right, she thought. So this. Facing the wall, she pressed the plastic sheet against it. It attached itself immediately, and she watched as it seemed to soak into the plasterwork, leaving behind a rectangle of thin black lines that grew steadily thicker and darker as she looked at them. When is a wall not a wall? Funny you should mention that. <laughs> Curiously enough, her door handle was different. An anodized aluminium lever instead of a round brass knob. She reached out, closed her eyes and gripped it. It felt faintly warm. Where do you want to go today? Emily hesitated. Out of here probably wasn't a precise enough answer. Home? No. Gomez's office, so I can smash his ever-loving face in. Tempting, but on balance not a good idea. I can go anywhere I like, she thought. Rome, Lisbon, Marrakesh. None of the above. The question, she realised, had only one answer because, of course, the door didn't belong to her. And however nice it was to fantasise about what she'd do if she had a door of her very own, the fact was that she didn't. Unless, of course, there really were two of them. Only one way to find out. Wherever Frank is, Emily thought, and pushed down the handle. Colin Gomez looked at his watch. He was pleased at how miserable he felt. It showed character, he thought, to be so upset about killing Emily Spitzer. There had been times over his long years in a profession when he'd wondered if he was growing callous, insensitive to the human cost of doing his job. He'd remembered old Mr. Kropacek, the butcher of Lombard Street, his first boss, a man utterly devoid of compassion and scruple, and just occasionally he wondered if he was turning into him. Apparently not. Marty Kropacek wouldn't have thought twice about unleashing a whole lower jaw's worth of spectral warriors in Trafalgar Square on New Year's Eve if there would have been money in it, and he certainly wouldn't have agonised about it after the event. Colin, by contrast, had been moping about in the place ever since he'd emptied the bag and closed up the basement wall, to the extent that he'd hardly managed to get any work done since. So that was all right. Twenty minutes. More than enough time for twelve spectral warriors to slaughter one unarmed girl. He sighed and rose from his chair. Better go and tidy up the mess. There was the small matter of getting rid of the spectral warriors, but he knew how to do that. From the bag on his desk he picked out a dozen teeth. An equal number of warriors from separate sawings will invariably attack each other and, being implacable and perfectly matched, wipe each other out. Expensive. Colin was still dreading what his partners were going to say about it at the next finance meeting. He might even insist that the cost of the warriors should come out of Colin's share of the next quarter's profits. Bitterly unfair. He just have to be stoical about it, but effective. And right now, he just wanted the whole wretched business done and out the way. Down the stairs, 
through the big door, down the hateful, vertiginous spiral staircase, never intended to accommodate someone of his weight and girth. He was well aware that the issue of why he'd been kept in the dark about the portable door was still entirely unresolved, something else to worry about. It had not been a good day, in any respect. In the top half of the Parker Shaw Univis, there's a little sliding panel you can draw back and look in through, the sort of thing you get in prisons. Colin opened it, threw in the handful of teeth and quickly slammed it shut. Another great merit of the park ashore is its soundproofing. He gave it five minutes, more than enough time, then opened the door and went through. Not a pretty sight. Spectral warriors can take an obscene amount of damage before they die, and Colin Gomez wished he'd had the sense to put his Wellington boots on before coming down. A quick head count. Twenty-four of them, only a few still attached to necks, so that was... Twenty-four. It was one of those moments when you feel completely hollow, like an egg sucked by a well-instructed grandmother. Two dozen heads. He swallowed hard and inspected them, one by one. It was hard to be sure the state some of them were in, but he was fairly certain that none of them was enemies. He slumped against a wall. Marvellous, he thought. Nigh on three hundred thousand dollars worth of stock in hand gone down the toilet, and to crown it all, the girl would appear to have escaped. The practice of magic requires exceptional powers of mental discipline, and these stood Colin Gomez in good stead as he leaned there, gazing at the mess. They made it possible for him not to think of what Amelia Carrington was going to say when he told her that he'd failed again. That was just as well, since the blind panic would have paralysed him, and he needed a clear head. He looked down at something lying near his feet on the floor. No pun intended, he thought. Somehow, God only knew how, that bloody Spitzer girl had escaped. Furthermore, she now knew for Stone Cold certain that he was out to get her. The chances of her being at her desk at nine sharp tomorrow morning were, therefore, slight. But if she'd done the sensible thing and put as much distance between herself and him as is possible on a curved planet, how the hell was he going to find her and finish the job? He slid down the wall and sat in something sticky. Amelia Carrington might just let him off with a reduced profit share and a severe bollocking if he brought Emily's head in a jar along to their meeting. Otherwise, he was done for, and to think he'd actually been feeling guilty about having her put down. Old Marty had been right. No place for bleeding hearts in the magic business. Talking of which, he identified the sticky thing he'd been sitting on, picked it off his trouser seat and threw it away. Finding a competent magical practitioner who doesn't want to be found is the next best thing to impossible. The rewards and cloaks, invisibility charms and stealth locks, and even Krekner's mirror can be banjaxed if you're savvy enough. Emily Spitzer hadn't had much experience in that area, but she was resourceful, a quick study and highly motivated, and if she had access to the sort of kit she'd have needed to get out of a self-sealing basement, kit like, oh, to take an example completely at random, a portable door. The gurgling noise that the ship makes as it closes over the top of your head is quite unmistakable, and Colin Gomez heard it very clearly. What hurt him most of all was the unfairness of it, because he'd always been a good soldier, a true believer, and in spite of that, maybe, God help him because of it, he'd been singled out to take the fall in whatever loathsome scheme Amelia Carrington was brewing up. Really, it was more than flesh and blood could bear. It was almost as bad as working for Enron. Hell hath no fury like a true believer forced to revise his basic assumptions. Standing in the gore-flecked Carrington's basement with the blood of spectral warriors trickling down the inside of his trouser leg, Colin Gomez made his grand renunciation and declaration of war. It was a noble moment, and he couldn't help feeling rather good about it. But, once the emotion had thinned out a bit, he also couldn't help noticing how frail his position actually was. Such resources as his position as a partner in the firm afforded him couldn't be relied on for much longer. Amelia would be after him first thing in the morning, wanting to be told that Emily was dead and he knew he wouldn't be able to fend her off for very long. After that, he could only think of one possible ally he could call on, 
assuming, sardonic little laugh, that he could find her. Well, maybe he couldn't, but a phone signal probably could. Carrington's equipped their staff with Kawaguchiya MP6530s, total network coverage guaranteed everywhere, deep in the Earth's magma layer, the craters of the moon, even railway tunnels. And one thing, a girl of Emily's generation would never, ever do, no matter what the circumstances, was switch off her mobile. Colin Gomez took out his pocket diary and looked up her number. Better, they say, to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. Bullshit, Frank reflected, staring at the wooden rafters of the cabin. That's a bit like saying it's better to fall off the roof of a very tall building than to have stayed on the ground. A man can get sick of the sight of rafters, even his own, but there was nothing else to claim his attention, so he carried on staring. Love, he thought, what a bloody silly idea. Investing all your hopes, the whole point of living, in someone you've only just met, who you know next to nothing about. He's on a par with putting all your money on a racehorse you've picked out of the list in a morning paper, using a blindfold and a pin. Before he'd met her, well, his life had been empty and meaningless, but it hadn't really bothered him so terribly much. He'd had the door after all. He'd amused himself with sightseeing trips through time and space, earned a little money, done a little collateral good. Now... Having loved and lost, he had no interest in metaphysical tourism, no point. The landscape and the background might change, but he would stay the same. Even the best holiday is no fun if you can't stand the person you go with. To have loved and lost, it made it sound like a competition. We loved, I lost. If so, then in love, as in freestyle knife fighting, the silver medal isn't worth having. Alternatively, to have lost your love sounds like sheer carelessness. Where did you have it last? Have you checked all your pockets? He hadn't mislaid it. It hadn't fallen down the back of the sofa. He'd offered her his heart and she had stomped all over it. That's me, Frank thought. Squashed, rather than broken-hearted. With nothing to do and no place to go. That's not tragic, not even sad. It's just plain silly. He still had the door. No job running errands for Mr Sprague, though. But so what? The world was full of opportunities. Other insurance companies, for example. Pick one at random. That was how he'd first met George Sprague. Make them an offer they couldn't refuse. Back to work. And who knew? Maybe the genuine girl of his dreams was already there waiting for him. Wherever there proved to be. More than one of her, even. For all he knew, they were queuing up somewhere, like people waiting to audition for the X Factor. Of course, he could stay exactly where he was, staring at rafters until he died of old age. Or he could get off up his arse, unfurl the door like Columbus's seals, and go exploring for strange new worlds. More as well, he decided. Nothing better to do. Frank stood up and reached in his pocket for the door. It wasn't there. In a sense, it was exactly what he'd been hoping for. A few minutes ago, if asked what he wanted most in the world, he'd probably have said, to stop moping around thinking about Emily. Fine. Another wish granted ahead of schedule by the genie of the rafters. Thoughts of lost love and post-romantic nihilism evaporated out of his brain like spit on a hot stove. He performed the frantic, pathetic ballet of the man who's just lost something. The pirouetting round and around, the pocket patting, the ratting terrier crouch, bum in the air, head under the sofa, the piercing up and down with eyes glued to the floor, the whole business, the whole shebang. But the cabin was very, very small and very sparsely furnished. If he'd dropped the door, or if it had fallen out of his pocket, it would have stood out on his bare, uncluttered floorboards like a haystack in a packet of needles. It was not there. It had been there a short while ago, because he'd used it to come home with, but it wasn't there now. Had to be somewhere. Can't have vanished as if by magic. Frank closed his eyes and flopped against the wall. By magic was almost certainly how it had vanished, Basically, the reverse of the procedure by which Dad had come by it in the first place. Looked at from that perspective, there was a kind of beautiful symmetry about it. From every other angle, he was utterly screwed. 
not just because he'd lost the only valuable thing he'd ever owned. Without it, he was several days grueling walk from the nearest source of food, and there wasn't so much as a stale red cracker in the house. He was looking around for something to prise the floorboards up with when he heard a creak behind him. He looked around and saw a thin black line running horizontal across the back wall. As he stared at it, two more lines dropped down at each end, forming the outline of a rectangle. He'd never seen the door opening from the outside, of course, just as you've never sat in the back seat of your own car. It was only when the handle appeared that he realised what he was looking at. He started to yelp with joy and then froze. The door was opening. Someone was coming through it. For one horrible second, he thought it might turn out to be himself, but it was not. He'd never have been able to cram his foot into the narrow black court shoe that crossed the threshold into the cabin. But if it was not him... Hello, Emily said. When Frank opened his mouth to reply, he had no idea what was going to come out of it. Could have been, that's so wonderful, I thought I'd never see you again. Or, that's so wonderful, I thought I'd never see you again. Not his first thought, but valid nonetheless. Or, if he'd been up to being cool and laid back about it all, Hi, thanks for dropping in. Or even, it was there in his mind, Oh God, the place a real miss. <laughs> it's just I've been so busy lately. As it was, he heard himself say, It's mine, you can't have it, give it back. Emily stood perfectly still and looked at him. And he thought, well that's buggered that up. Well done, Frank. Because of course, she'd heard all five versions. I'm sorry, he mumbled. I didn't mean... She winced, as though he'd shouted in her ear. Then she had that let's-get-it-over-with look on her face. Frank, she said, there's something you ought to know about me. Not what he'd been expecting, in fact. For a moment, he forgot all about the door. Oh, he said. Well, no, please don't say anything, she snapped. Not anything at all, until I've explained. But quiet. She sounded just like his mother. At some point or other, all women do. Now then, Emily perched on the edge of the table and gave him another look, but it wasn't any of the looks in the handbook. It's a bit awkward. It's got magic in it, for a start. Frank knew he wasn't allowed to speak, but nodding was presumably still permitted. He nodded. When you say something, pause, basically, it's a side effect of drinking troll's blood. He must have pulled a fierce, because she gave him a don't-be-such-a-sissy look, which, he couldn't help thinking, was a little bit much. It was an accident, she went on. I was doing a job earlier. A troll cut himself. I must have got a drop of his blood on my finger or something. Anyway, <laughs> she continued, it means that when you say something, well, I hear it, obviously, but I also hear what you really mean, what you wanted to say but didn't. I can't help it. She added, it's just magic, occupational hazard, and uh, Frank could feel his face burning, the perfect beetroot impersonation. Absolutely no need for her to tell him to be quiet now. Well, she said, now you know. There is an antidote, and I had a dose before I met you tonight, and we went to your Mr. Sprague's office. It sort of wore off, and... He didn't need Troll's blood to let him know what Emily was feeling, just as you didn't need to hear it ticking to know what a black pointy nose cylinder with fins is a bomb. It was, after all, exactly how he'd be feeling in her shoes. Embarrassed, of course, angry, stress levels off the dial, and scared. Well, she said, say something. You told me not to. I love you, too. At which precise moment, Emily's phone rang. About ringtones. They are, of course, a statement about who you think you are, who you want to be, who you want other people to think you are, and all that malarkey. The trouble is, you choose them in quiet, restful moments, when you're generally off your guard. At such a time, your judgment is usually subordinated to your whim, and even a normally rational person is capable of thinking that having your fawn warble Crazy Frog or James Blunt is a really fun idea, or, in Emily's case, the laughing policeman. She cringed, which is a bit like saying the Second World War was a scuffle. At first, she pretended to ignore it, as if trying to make out that it was something going on in the street outside, Geography was against her there, though. 
She might just have got away with it if she'd gone with a rutting stag, but basically she was on a hiding to nothing and she knew it. My phone, <laughs> she whimpered. Just a second. She scrabbled in her pocket and pulled it out, hating it. Yes? Emily, Colin Gomez here. Colin Gomez had a carrying sort of voice, even over a mobile. Frank nodded and stood up. I'll make us a cup of tea, he said. Hello? Gomez, sounding faintly querulous. Hello? Are you there? En route to the kettle, Frank stopped and watched Emily. She'd gone ever such a funny colour, and she seemed to have forgotten about breathing and stuff. Then she smiled. Mr Gomez, she said, I'm glad you called. I'm going to kill you. What? It's not a terribly good line. You'll have to speak. And when I've done that, Emily went on, I'm going to chop you up into little bits and feed you to the piranhas in Sally Crank's office. Oh, and I quit. Goodbye. She stabbed a button so hard that Frank winced. Then she threw the fawn across the room. Sorry about that, she said. My boss, he tried to murder me earlier. It's all right, she added. You can talk now. Frank pressed his lips together and shook his head. Please? Yes, but... And then the policeman started laughing again. Oh, for crying out loud. Emily lunged across the cabin, snatched up the fawn, stabbed it again and snapped, What? There's no need to shout, said Colin Gomez's voice. First, uh, I'd like to apologise for what happened earlier. You total fucking butt! And, Gomez went on, I need to know if you still want your job. <laughs> Silence, apart from a faint rumbling from the kettle. Hello? Are you still there? Yes, of course I bloody well am. What do you... I can't explain over the phone, Gomez said, but... His voice lowered so that she could barely hear it. Let's just say there could well be some changes in the way the firm's run quite soon. Not entirely unconnected with the, uh, incident. Frank looked at her. Troll's blood, she'd said. Could he really love somebody it was impossible to lie to? Yes, he thought. I see, Emily said. Oh, while I think of it, when we went to see Mr Pickersgill, he cut himself. I'm sorry, but I fail to see. Tastes like chicken. Ah. Long, long silence. In which case... Gomez said brightly. You believe me? No choice, really. Excellent. How soon can you be in my office? Emily smiled. You'd be surprised. Actually, I wouldn't. You've got it, haven't you? Her eyebrows shot up, but she replied. Long story. Slight hesitation. If I come, you won't try and kill me, will you? No. You're right. Actually, it would be. OK, I'll be there. She stopped and looked at Frank. Soon. Something here I've got to take care of first. Be as quick as you can, then. No, she said, and hit the button. They looked at each other. Tea's ready, Frank said. Emily thought about what Gomez had just said. All of it. Then she dropped the fawn on the floor and jumped on it. So we won't be interrupted, she said, and kissed him. <laughs> Kissy faces! <laughs> oh, I love that bit. Hey. I like that bit. Right, okay. Hmm. So, we have got Emily and Frank reunited. Our Mr Gomez being a bit of a... A bit of a toad. Um, but clearly a very, very two-faced one. A little bit of a dragon having a bit of a snooze. And lots of other stuff going on. But where is the other portable door? Where is Frank's original portable door? Where did it go? Where's Mr Sprague? Where's Frank's little puppy dog? We all forgot about him, didn't we? So if you got this far, thank you very, very, very much. I do appreciate you. Um, if you'd like to leave a little sandwich emoji in the comment section and um, whatever your favourite food is, that would be pretty awesome. Or pretty much leave any emoji that you want to because they're always fun to see, as are the conversations that you'll have because it's just just so heartwarming. I, I can't even tell you. I love how you're all chatting. It's, it's fantastic. But... Um, hopefully we'll get another um, another episode in a couple of days time and of course please let me know how you're getting on 
take care of yourselves. Keep warm if you've got cold weather, keep cool if you've got hot weather, and take it easy, Petal. See you in a couple of days. I really should get a music outro, maybe. Something comical, maybe a laughing policeman. Who knows? I'll stop whiffling now. See you next time.